Hello, I'm Gary. And I'm Dottie. And this travel log is about our trip to China, Tibet, and Mongolia in 2014. We departed out of Newark on April the 17th, and 16 hours later we arrived in Hong Kong. The total mileage to Hong Kong was 8,598 miles. After we caught a quick dinner of noodles and veggies, we tried to get some sleep so we could wake up and tour again tomorrow. Hong Kong has a population of 7 million. Our tour of Hong Kong began by contrasting the old with the new. This is an older style apartment building that reminded us of those we saw in Beijing back in the early 1990s. We then started viewing some of the newer parts on Hong Kong Island. Our hotel was located in the Kowloon section of Hong Kong. We traveled through the harbor tunnel under the water and ended up on Hong Kong Island and started proceeding up the hill to a, for a view of Hong Kong City. Lots of apartment houses and other things to see. We found out that Hong Kong is one of the most expensive places to live in the world. A 500-foot condo can sell here for $4 million U.S. Most of the tourists at the top of the hill overlooking Hong Kong Island are Chinese. After our view from the hill of Hong Kong, we then visited a neighboring town of Aberdeen, which is known as Small Hong Kong. This town was founded in 1842 and fast became a fishing village. It's interesting because the population in this area went from 50,000 to 10,000 people. As the population aged and died off, the young and educated moved away. While there, we took a tour of the harbor on a typical junk. While most of the group was on their boat trip, I heard running water and went to investigate. I found out it was a yacht club right next to where the dock was for the boat trip. And I just sat there with a nice cup of coffee and waited for the group to return. After my coffee break, I went back to the boat dock and arrived there just as the boat was returning. I have a question for you. Do you know the difference between a junk and a sampan? More later. This is a view of Aberdeen Bay. This bay gave Hong Kong its name, which literally translated means fragrant harbor. That evening, our group went out to a nice restaurant by the harbor for a Peking duck dinner. One of the highlights of visiting Hong Kong is the light show in the evening. This is a view across the Hong Kong Harbor. This is the second time we have witnessed this light show. The first time we saw it, we were on a ship going through the harbor, cruising to the South China Sea. The entire light show is accompanied by sound that matches many of the blinking lights across the harbor. The finale is a spectacular laser show.
Getting back to my question about the difference between a junk and a sandpan. A junk someone lives on, so this would be a junk in this picture. A sandpan is more of a taxi, and sandpan means three pieces of wood. It's lunchtime, not only for us, but for the egret as well. If you'll note, he has a fish in his beak. The next morning, some of us took a little bus trip in Hong Kong and saw many of the people bustling about on a Sunday morning. Lots of nice fruit stands. The Peking duck dinner we had the night before was delicious, but you can also get Peking duck as a takeaway. Later that day, we flew north to the city of Guilin. This is located on the Li River, and we stayed at the Park Hotel. The Park Hotel is located on a small lake, which as you can see is well lit at night. It's now Easter Monday, and we're up bright and early, and away we go for a cruise on the Lee River. This is also called Mother River. Today, we're only going to travel about 50 miles. Part of the attraction of this area are the limestone hills. These hills were created as the rains washed away all the soft matter and all that was left were these beautiful limestone peaks. One of the trees in this area is called the osmanthus and it's known for its flower. The flower is used for wine and tea. The Gulin area is also known for its hot sauce. It's also known for fermented tofu, which is also called stinky toe, which we don't know if that's what they're cooking on the back of this ship or not, but um, I can tell you uh, we had nothing to eat on the boat. Along the way, we were approached by many vendors on these little bamboo rafts. Many of them nowadays are made out of PVC instead of bamboo. This is a group of cormorants that has been trained to fish. These are still used in some parts of China, but for the most part, they're just for the tourists. Gulin is also known for its modern treasures one of which are landscape paintings, the sea pearl, and herbal medicines. This section of the Li River is so famous, it's depicted on Chinese money. While we were cruising the Li River, we were offered some snake wine. Any takers? We saw herds of water buffalo along the way, and they're used mainly for labor and food. Close up of a cormorant and a fisherman. We have a short video clip to show you of our experiences along the Lee River. This is an example of the type of tour boat we were on. You can see this is a very popular tour. Luckily, ours wasn't as crowded. The river was quite calm that day, but as you can see, it was pretty foggy. These small taxis along the Lee River were, ta were taking individual small tour groups along with them. And you as you can see coming up here, there were quite a few of them on the river that day.
This particular limestone peak runs right down to the river. And if you look closely in the center there, you'll see what is a remnant of a road still being used that has partially collapsed. And rather than repair the road, they have decided to just put up a little fence along the breakdown. If you are a brave soul, you can drive along this road. What? 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 A waterfall, right? To, oh, wow. My rig. Oh. After serving tea on this cruise boat, they're washing the dishes in the back of the boat using the river water. The area along the river is very sparsely populated, but every once in a while we'd run across a very small village. One, two, three. One, two, three. Done. One, two, three. Done. <laughs> The cruise ended at a very famous city in China called Yangshu. As we walked through town, we noted this lady chopping peppers. Notice the gloves to keep the acid off of her hands. China has 56 nationalities throughout. That evening, we saw a cultural show called Sanji Liu Impressions. As you will see, it was very colorful.
the next morning we had to meet the group at 545. We're lucky that we had a wake-up call at 530 because that woke us up. Our stop that morning was at the Reed Flute Cave. On our way to the cave, there was a group doing Tai Chi. This cave was discovered over 1,000 years ago. Before opening to the public in 1962, it was used for a living area. The formations are beautiful, highlighted by colored floodlights. There was a pond down inside the cave that was showing us some beautiful reflections. On the way out of the cave, we went past this formation in the shape of a horse. On the way to the airport, we visited the South China Sea Pearl Factory. A nice sized pearl can take up to 10 years to form. There are very few natural pearls today. They're cultured, which means that the oyster is fed a piece of sand to start the formation. Our first stop in Shanghai was the Shanghai Museum. It was originally opened in 1952 and has been at this location since 1996. One of the exhibits was clothing that is particular to the 56 different nations within China. Another exhibit contained religious and ceremonial masks from all over China. Another area showed ritual and ornamental jades. This slit ring dates to 6000 BC. This piece of jade is a model of a mountain with figures. It's from the Qing Dynasty and dates from 1644. Another area of the museum contained porcelain work. Our second stop was Xiandi, an area of dilapidated buildings called Shikumen, because many families lived in the same small space. Jackie Chan restored these buildings and built a house in this area as well. This stone house is an example of a Shikumen. It housed up to six families at once. This fountain in Xintiandi represents love, charity, and prosperity. I'd like to give you just a few facts about Shanghai. Shanghai itself means kidnapped. It is the number one port city in the world. It takes up 6% of the total area of China. There are over 4 million cars here. The population of Shanghai is 23 million. There are over 4,000 skyscrapers here, which means a building of over 30 floors. The primary industries are the motor industry, that's GM and Volkswagen, banking and shipping. The traffic laws here are just a suggestion. They are terrible drivers here in Shanghai. 700 years ago, Shanghai was just a small fishing village. In 1600, the population here was 25,000. By the end of the 1800s, the population had grown to 1 million. In 1842, the Opium Wars began here. This is our group gathering to uh, go on to the next location. As you can see, we have sweaters on, so it was a little cool. This is the Bund area. B-U-N-D area of Shanghai, which is where the old meets the new. 
the old section is still the business area of the city. This was interesting to watch. Here they are planting a wall. As you can see, they take flowers and put them in the little holes there, and uh, it makes a beautiful design along this wall. As you can see, they have a long way to go. Next, we have a clip of the sights and sounds around restored Old Town Shanghai. You might notice some of the more modern stores. This is a view from the 88th floor of one of the towers. Going up in the elevator, it only took us 45 seconds. There were some spectacular views of the old and the new Shanghai. It only takes the Chinese 15 days to build a 30-story building. Everything is prefab, and it's just constructed right on site. Our next adventure was taking a ride on the Maglev train. It is the fastest in the world. Here's a clip. This train goes 267 miles per hour. You can go 19 miles in just 7 minutes. The total cost of this train was $1.2 billion dollars and it's going to take between 60 and 70 years to recoup this money. As two trains pass, you can feel a one-second vibration. The scaffolding around this new construction is made of bamboo still widely used in China for this purpose. This tranquil setting is located in the Shu Gardens, which are right in the heart of Shanghai. These gardens began in 1559 and took 20 years to complete. Here's a roof ornament. The garden represents five elements, water, fire, wood, earth, and metal. After a long day of touring and dinner, we went for a foot massage. But it was painful at times because the water was really, really hot. This is a pile of mulberry leaves. And in that you can see the silkworms as well as the cocoons. The Silk Road began in Shanghai because this was one of the best areas for the mulberry tree. The worm can have 400 babies that grow to maturity in 15 days. One cocoon can produce as much as one mile of silk. The life cycle of the silkworm is 45 days. After the silk factory, we boarded a plane and headed for Yi Chang which is where we boarded the riverboat to take a tour of the Yangtze River. Gary surprised me for this tour because he upgraded us to a suite. This is the view from our suite as we head along the Yangtze. We began our journey on the river below the dam. This part of the river is virtually unchanged. Because of the dam, it is now protected from the annual flooding that used to devastate this area. We went to visit the tribe of the Three Gorges. We were greeted by these ancient junks at the entrance to their village. Breakfast was offered along the way, but we decided to pass. 
This tribal reenactment shows life the way it used to be along the Yangtze River. It took us a couple of hours to complete our tour of this area and we were mostly walking on a fairly modern walkway along the river. But this shows some old steps that we encountered along the way. I'm glad we didn't have to walk on them. Traditional flute music was demonstrated by this couple along the way. They were standing on a bridge over the river. As we walked along, we saw a traditional fishing boat. Here are the nets for catching the fish, of course, and the cormorants. Now what they do with the cormorants is they tie, the fishermen tie a string around the cormorant's neck to keep the cormorant from swallowing the fish. They then, with a string tied to the leg of the cormorant, put him off into the water, comes back up with a fish, the fisherman squeezes the neck and the fish comes back out. At the end of the day, they take the string off and allow the cormorant to fish for himself. Bamboo water wheels. And next comes the wash day. It's the monkeys. <laughs> Couldn't resist. These monkeys live on the hillsides all up and down uh, this location. And as you can see, there's always someone available there to sell some monkey chow. And now on to the waterfall. We caught this snail on a long and arduous journey. We have an entire video while it goes 35 feet. Please pay attention. We attended a mock wedding ceremony. Here's the bride tossing a bouquet out to a prospective husband. custom is that before the wedding the bride cries for five days and this is because of grief in losing her family. It just so happens that the husband in this case was one of our people. After our visit to the tribe of the Three Gorges we went back to our ship along an ancient covered walkway. On our way back to the ship, we went through a small market. Now we begin our tour of the Three Gorges Dam and the area above it. This picture shows the dam as it was completed. The Three Gorges Dam was started in 1994 and not finished until 2009. It is the largest conservancy project that has ever been undertaken. The Yangtze River itself is 3,900 miles long. The dam itself is 7,660 feet long. It's 600 feet high, 60 feet wide at the top, and 430 feet wide at the bottom. It raised the river level by 575 feet, creating a 372-mile reservoir. The purpose of the dam was to control floods, electricity, navigation, and irrigation. 
The dam is the highest power station in the world. The hydroelectric plant has 32 main turbines, each with a generating capacity of 700 megawatts. In 2013, the dam produced and distributed 83.7 terawatt hours of electrical energy to the people of China. The dam broke the world record generating capacity on an annual basis in 2014. Over 1 million tons of concrete were used, along with enough steel to create 63 Eiffel Towers. There are still some controversies as the dam flooded archaeological and cultural sites and displaced some 1.3 million people and is causing significant ecological changes even today, including an increased risk of landslides. This is our riverboat, the motor vessel Jenna. We docked along the river and took a bus tour to see the Three Gorges Dam. As we approached the dam, we could see how big it really was, even though it was somewhat obscured by all of the electrical lines. Even though we can't see the entire dam here, you get an idea of how massive it is. We toured an area that showed us a model of the dam as well as the lock system. There are two locks, each with five levels, allowing shipping to go in both directions. It takes about three hours to go through the locks. Here we are approaching the first lock on our ship. Along the way we saw hanging coffins. This is an ancient burial method. How do you think they got the coffins up there? Well, they actually lowered them down from the top on ropes. Above the dam, there are three gorges. These gorges were formed over 80 million years ago. They are the Xiling, the Wu, and the Qutang. All three of these gorges have benefited from the dam because they are now much less treacherous. Even though, as you can see here, the fishermen are having a pretty rough ride, but this is still very calm for them. We made a stop along the way, and again we were offered lunch. We decided to pass. Then we stayed there for a culture show. that if a woman washes her hands in the Yangtze in this area, she will be a better cook. China's two largest rivers are the Yellow and the Yangtze, which both run west to east. There are 700 tributaries off of the Yangtze River. 
450 million people depend on the Yangtze River. Our attention drifted to the hillside where we saw this lady walking up from the river with supplies. Hey, hey, there's more monkeys. We passed several pagodas along the way. Along the way, we passed two huge cities. As you can see, they're still under construction. Before the dam was built, people were used to living in apartments about the size of 500 square feet. But after the dam was built and people had to be relocated, they were offered apartments of some 2,000 square feet. The young people really loved this, but the older folks who were used to living where they were just moved a little bit further up the hillside. From the top of our riverboat, we could see this area of shrines and monuments up on the hillside. We were allowed to go up there, but we decided to stay on board because it's quite a climb. Uh, something near and dear to my heart. As we passed along here, you can see that they're cultivating corn, and they also had crops of green beans, and various other fruits and vegetables. Manual methods are still being used along the river. We saw all kinds of livestock along the river as well. Ancient trackers working on a gang would pull the boats up the river. This, of course, was before the dam was built. We also saw fishermen along the way. And here's a family washing their clothes while the father works on the boat. Here's one of the local families of the area. Some of the farming is terraced up these steep hills. While on the ship, we were fascinated to stand and watch this gentleman painting the inside of these bottles. On the final morning of our river cruise, we got off the boat really early in the morning and took a four-hour bus ride to Chengdu to visit the Panda Preserve. Pandas like these in captivity can live to 30 years of age. So far this program has been very successful. The preserve also houses the rare red panda. Red pandas live about 17 years and they resemble a large fox with a bushy tail. So now let's take a look at some pandas doing what they do most of the time. That is eating bamboo shoots or sleeping.
After a sumptuous meal that evening, we went to our hotel for a good night's sleep before heading off towards Tibet in the morning. Sixteen of the world's tallest mountains are in Tibet, including Mount Everest. Almost the entire distance between Chengdu and Lhasa is covered with mountains. It's very rugged territory. Lhasa is in a valley surrounded by mountains. As we landed and got off the airplane, we immediately noticed the 12,000 foot altitude because it was very difficult to breathe. Our first glimpse of the Potala Palace, the home of the Dalai Lama, as we entered the city of Lhasa. Lhasa is 3,100 years old and it means land of the Buddha. This is our hotel in Lhasa, which was very nice. It's very dry here. Even with the humidifier running at full blast in our room, it was still very dry. Instead of shaving cream and magazines in the store in the hotel lobby, all we could see was medicinal remedies of various herbs and things like that. This is a view of the Potolot Palace, the home of the Dalai Lama who is number 14 in the chain, and he now resides in northern India. A lot of changes are taking place in Tibet today because of the tourist dollar. A lot of the old ways are fading. All the people here are walking in a clockwise direction around the palace. They are using prayer wheels and beads. The palace dominates Lhasa, much as the Dalai Lama dominates the Tibetan faith and politics. The palace is all original, and the part of it dates to the 7th century. If you'll note the white part of the palace, that was added in 1645. There used to be 500 to 600 monks in residence here. Now there are only about 50 or 60. There are 385 steps to get to the top of this palace. Then, once you get there, you have to go inside, and there's a couple hundred more. This is a courtyard where visitors can take a break before they head into the rest of the palace to climb their way to the top. Once in the palace, there were no pictures, but we did get to see a reception hall. We saw uh, several monks praying and meditating, and there were also huge cauldrons of white cedar juniper and red cedar burning to clear the air and to prevent infectious disease. However, all it did for us was to choke us. We went through the tomb area for all of the Dalai Lamas in the palace. We saw uh, tombs for eight of the 14. The coffins are all adorned with gold and precious stones that are all donated by the local people. It is believed that Dalai Lamas number 9 and 12 were poisoned. Books written by Dalai Lamas are all in actual gold ink and there are thousands of them in the library. This view of Lhasa is taken from the top of the 385 steps. We either drank water or the local beer, which was very good. Here I am taking a picture of the Summer Palace when this Buddhist monk photobombs me. The Summer Palace here was built in 1820. It is 80% original. Our local guide explained to us how careful he has to be in answering questions about Buddhism because Big Brother is always listening and he can get into a lot of trouble. It is believed that the Dalai Lama never dies. He only changes his body. Buddhists believe in evolution, that we all came from monkeys, and not creation by God. We visited a Tibetan carpet factory. Here our group took turns at spinning the giant prayer wheel. 
Natural dyes are used for the carpets. You'll notice in the back a white tub containing yak dung, which is used to light fires. It's very crowded in town today because today is May 1st, May Day in China. This little lady in this picture caught my eye. We're now on our way to the Zhohang Temple, which is the oldest in Tibet. It was built in the 7th century by the first king of Tibet. This is one of the holiest and most often visited temples in, the, in Tibet. As we enter the grounds of the temple, there are large pots burning incense, and you'll also see a large collection of prayer flags. There's an area surrounding the temple called the Karma, where many come to bow down each day. They do as many as six to seven hundred bows, and this is each day. The feet should be kept together. At the entrance to the temple is a gold Buddhist symbol. Photography was not allowed inside of the temple, but once we got outside on the second level, we could take these pictures of what it looked like on the outside. As you can see, it was a beautiful day. Close to the Potala Palace. These are the temple grounds. There are three distinctions of Dalai Lama. Reincarnation, generational, and natural. The current Dalai Lama number 14 is reincarnated. All the houses in the city seem to have their own personal collection of prayer flags mounted on their roofs. One of the Buddhist monks and his prayer wheel. A street vendor was selling steamed eggs, corn, and something wrapped in uh, the little green packages there. We're not sure what it was. Since it was May Day, there were a lot of people around and nobody was allowed to ride bicycles, motor scooters, or even drive cars into the temple grounds. We paid a visit to the Sira Monastery, which is the second largest in Tibet. This is an important learning center for the Yellow Hat sect. Children are sent here as young as five years old to get a good education. All the monks here have a private teacher. This child with a bit of soot on her nose just means that she has been blessed at the temple. As we entered the monastery, there was an area for prayer wheels. The Yellow Hat sect is the most popular sect of monks. These monks gather every afternoon and they're called the arguing monks. An equal number sit and stand in the courtyard. The one standing asks the other a question and he must answer. As you can see this can become very animated and loud. Three elderly monks sit off to one side to, to discuss monastery issues as well as scripture. Our last night in Tibet, we went out to dinner to the original Crazy Yak restaurant. And you got it, Yak again. 
During our dinner, there was an interesting folkloric show going on. Very colorful. See if you can understand these emergency instructions on the back of our hotel room door. This morning we said goodbye to our group. Most of the group went to, on to Xi'an and other areas in China. Four of us took off to go to Mongolia. There is no easy way to get from Tibet to Mongolia. So we had to go and spend a night in Beijing. This is at the Beijing airport. On our way to Mongolia, we encountered the southern end of the Siberian mountain range. Before landing at Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia, which we'll henceforward call UB, which has a population of 1.8 million, and the overall population in Mongolia is 2.9 million. Mongolia was controlled by the Soviet Union for over 70 years. Mongolia is still an equestrian country. You see horses all along the streets and out along the highways. Oh, yeah. He survived. Our first close-up look at a yak. This is a typical small village along the way of yurts, or gurs, as they're called locally. Oh boy, here we are in Outer Mongolia. Who would have believed? And it's just as barren as Tibet. Here we're told that you must wear a hat all the time because lice will fall from trees or structures into your hair. Here we pay a visit to Turtle Rock. This morning it was 38 degrees and pretty chilly. Mongolia is 50% Buddhist. 60% of the people live in the Gur district. Temperatures here range from minus 25 degrees to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. This area out in the country is actually a tourist camp. We also saw this eagle in the field. This is our hotel in Outer Mongolia in a national park. It was very, very nice. This is just a part of our suite. Tourism to Mongolia increases about 1.3% each year. The Russians are the largest group that like to come here because they like to come to fish. The Chinese come in groups for tourism, also the Koreans and the Japanese. The lifespan here for men is 63 and women 65. The locals here eat mainly dumplings and curd and also boiled meat, which is usually mutton. The nomads who take care of these sheep and goats are very wealthy people. Each head here is worth about $300. Along a small little path, we encountered a herd of sheep and goats. There's a little teeny one up there. No, they're there. Little the babe. One. Oh, look at the little oh. black one. See the little black one, Gare? No, Dottie. What do you think I'm pointing at my camera at? On the horizon, we see a stainless steel statue of Chinggis Khan. 
In the U.S., we say Genghis, but over here they say Chinggis. On top of the gate are Chinggis's nine generals. There were fierce battles on the steps, so Khan had three generals before, three generals with him, and three generals behind to clean up. The Mughal king was well protected. The statue is over 130 feet tall. After taking an elevator and steps, we went out on a platform. We were looking at the countryside, and then we turned around, and we were face to face with Chinggis himself. An interesting note, the wife of Chinggis was a Christian named Bertie. Always on the lookout for the next tourist Tugrik, the local currency, here's an entrepreneur showing off his eagles. Nearby the complex is a statue of Mama Khan, Chinggis' mother. Nomads usually travel with two horses. In case one gets tired or something happens to one of them, they have a spare. All this guy wanted was a cigarette. Once off the main roads, you're on a rutted dirt path. We're on our way to visit a theme park called 13th Century which depicts how Mongolian life was back in the 13th century. It's very much like uh, Williamsburg to them. This part of the park depicts a relay station, an outpost used for communications. The inside shows examples of some of the armor that was used in the 13th century. Heating and cooking was done over a simple fire in the center of the yurt, or gur, fueled by dung. The sleeping facilities certainly did not look very comfortable, by at least by modern standards. The Mongols always faced their gur openings to the south, because that was direction from which the enemy came. At that time it was China. Here's a youth greeting us at the entrance to his compound. This is the craftsman camp. We were able to go inside and visit with his mother. <laughs> this is Khan's palace. In the summer, when everything is in full swing, you get to attend a great feast at this location. Camels were used by the nomads as beasts of burden. This is the herder's camp, and in this gur is where we had lunch. The table was set pretty close to the ground because the nomads usually eat while sitting on the ground, but at least we had a bench covered by some skins in the background there. Our lunch consisted of milk tea, mutton soup, and mutton stuffed bread. Yum! The restroom facilities, however, leave a lot to be desired. Shaman from different clans would gather here around the fire under the blue sky to perform ritual worship to Mother Nature 
and to the gods for one common deed. This is one of my favorite pictures from the trip. It's part of the ritual fence with prayer flags and yurts. Here's a pair of white cranes on the plains. Let's have a look at what they're doing. The, uh, the Demazol crane. Oh. Those are really common, common birds. In the oh, okay. They're very pretty, though. On our way back to our hotel, we saw this golf course. You can see that it has exactly one green in view. The next morning, we had an opportunity to go visit a local family. Along the way, we discussed a sky burial. This is after the person dies. The body is taken to a high elevation and laid out under the blue sky. The body is left, and the wolves and vultures finish the job. This burial is widely used in Tibet and somewhat in Mongolia. We had to cross this bridge to get to the local village. We also had our hats on. We are headed towards this small village of farmers. Along the way, we saw a gentleman cutting some firewood for his cooking. The yurt has a circular roof which represents the sun. The slabs holding the roof are curved and represent sun rays. The two posts in the middle not only support, but they represent man and woman. This couple is pretty prosperous as you will note from the refrigerator that's there and the electricity. They own the ponies that they take the visitors from the hotel on rides. We were offered yak butter tea and this dried yogurt, which is homemade. We were also offered Mongolian donuts, which are basically fried dough, much like Indian bread. All the comforts of home, including a color TV. This yurt is 14 years old. It was rebuilt on the site of the old yurt. The main religion here is Buddhist. There are, however, some Christians, but a small percentage. With young parents today out in the workforce, it's up to grandparents to take the children to school. And his mom is taking Grandma. Grandma. Uh -huh. I used to, when I was a youngster, I used to show cattle. Oh. We used to have some cattle. I used to show them at the local shows. Mm -hmm. So I've always been attached to cattle. <laughs> but cattle is a really useful animal. Oh, yeah. yeah. We can use the milk. Sure. After our stay in the countryside, we returned to Ulaanbaatar for lunch and we had a Mongolian barbecue. In the main square of the capital city is a government building. In the center of the government building is a statue of Chinggis Khan. On the right hand side of the government building is a statue of Kublai Khan one of Chinggis' sons. In the center of the square is a statue of the Russian general who brought Russian customs to Mongolia. On our last night there, we had a dinner party at a restaurant called Mongolians in their private little dining room. On one page of the menu, it appears you can get steamed sheep's head or steamed horse ribs. We had something a little bit calmer. From our hotel window, we could see several military vehicles on the streets, as well as the military marching. 
And there, right in the foreground, is a yurt. Our final view of Mongolia was the Chinggis Khan International Airport. This is a very large airport having one gate. We left from here on our way back to Beijing for one more overnight stay before our return home. We had some free time to walk around the town. We saw this area where they were cooking all kinds of strange things. Here are some scorpions on a stick waiting to be cooked. We rejoined our group and visited the Temple of Heaven. This was built in 1420 to help provide good harvests. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's said to be good luck for the bride and groom to have their picture taken on the steps of the Temple of Heaven. This is a park on the grounds of the Temple of Heaven. After retirement, and men retire at 60, women at 58, the locals use this park for exercise and a gathering place. There were lots of card games and crafts going on here. After visiting the Temple of Heaven and its park, we got back on our bus for the airport and our return home.